why the sea moans. You see, once upon a time, there was a little princess who lived in a magnificent royal palace. All around the palace was a beautiful garden full of lovely flowers and rare shrubs and trees. Now the part of the garden that the princess liked most was a corner of it that ran down to the sea. She was a very lonely little princess, and she loved to sit and watch the changing beauty of the sea. The name of the little princess was Dionysa, and it often seemed to her that the sea said as it rushed against the shore, Dionysa, Dionysa. One day, when the little princess was sitting all alone by the sea, she said to herself, Oh, I am so lonely. I do so wish that I had someone to play with. When I ride out in the royal chariot, I see little girls who have other little girls and boys to play with them. But alas, because I am the royal princess, I never have anyone to play with me. If I have to be the royal princess and not play with other children, I do think I might have some sort of living thing around that would play with me. Then a most remarkable thing happened. The sea said very slowly and distinctly and over and over again so there couldn't be any mistake about it. Dionysa, Dionysa. And the little princess walked up close to the sea, just as close as she dared to go without any danger of getting her royal shoes and stockings wet. Straight out of the biggest wave of all, there came a sea serpent to meet her. She knew that it was a sea serpent from the pictures in her royal story books, even though she had never seen a sea serpent before. But somehow, this sea serpent looked different than the pictures. Instead of being a fierce monster, it looked kind and gentle and good. She held her arms out to it right away. Come play with me, said Dionysa. I am Lazamina, and I have come to play with you, replied the sea serpent. After that, the little princess was very much happier. The sea serpent came out of the sea to play with her every day when she was alone. If anyone else came near, the sea serpent would disappear into the sea, so no one but Dionysa ever saw her. And so the years passed away, and each year that little princess, she grew to be a larger and larger princess. At last she was sixteen years old and a very grown-up princess indeed, but she still enjoyed her old playmate, and they were often together on the seashore. One day, when they were walking up and down together beside the sea, the sea servant looked at Dionysa with sad eyes and said, I too have been growing older all these years, dear Dionysa. The time has come that we can no longer play together. I shall never come out of the sea to play with you any more, but I shall never forget you, and I shall always be your friend. I hope that you will never have any trouble in your life, but if you ever should, call my name and I will come to help you. Then the sea serpent, she disappeared into the sea. Now about this time, the mother of a neighboring prince felt that it was time for her son to marry. She gave her son a jeweled ring and said, I ask you to marry a princess upon whose finger this ring shall be neither too large, too tight, nor too loose. The prince immediately set out to look for a princess to be his bride. He visited many royal palaces and tried the ring upon the finger of many royal princesses. Upon some, the ring was too tight. Upon others, it was too, too loose. There was no princess whose finger fitted the ring perfectly. At last that prince came to the royal palace where the princess Dionysa lived. The princess had dreams of her own of a young and charming prince who would someday come to wed her, so she was not pleased at all. This prince was old and not handsome at all in Dionysa's eyes, but when he tried the ring upon her finger, it fitted as if it had meant to be there. The princess Dionysa was much overcome. Please don't make me marry him, she begged her royal father. Her father told her what a wealthy prince he was with a great kingdom and a wonderful royal palace ever so much more wonderful and grand than the palace the princess Dionysa had always had for her home. The truth be told, her father really had no patience for Dionysa for not being happy about the upcoming marriage. You ought to consider yourself the most fortunate princess in all the world, he said. But Dionysa did not. She spent her days and nights weeping. Her father was afraid that she would grow so thin that the ring would no longer fit her finger. So he hastened the plans of the wedding. Now one day, Dionysa walked up and down beside the sea, crying as if her heart would break. All at once, she stopped crying. How stupid I have been, she said. My old playmate told me that if ever I was in trouble, she would come back and help me. With all my silly crying, I had forgotten all about it. Dionysa walked up close to the sea with not a care for her royal stockings or her royal shoes and called softly. Out of the sea came the sea serpent, just as she used to appear. Wasting not a moment, Dionysa explained to the sea serpent all about the dreadful trouble which was threatening to spoil her life. Have no fear, said the serpent. Simply tell your father that you will marry the prince when the prince presents you with a dress, the color of the fields and all their flowers. Say, too, that you would not consider marrying him until he gives it to you. 
Then the sea serpent disappeared again into the sea. Dionysa quickly sent word through her father to her royal suitor that she would wed him only when he procured a dress for her, the color of the fields, and all their flowers. Now the prince, he was very much in love with Dionysa, so he was secretly filled with joy at this request. He searched everywhere for a dress, the color of the fields, and all their flowers. Now, as you can imagine, it was a very difficult thing to find, but at last he procured one. When Dionysa saw that the prince had really found the dress for her, she was filled with grief. She thought there was no escape and that she would have to marry the prince after all. As soon as she could get away from the palace without being noticed, she ran to the sea and she called again for her friend, the sea serpent. She came at once out of the sea. Do not fear, she said to Dionysa. Go back and say that you will not wed the prince until he gives you a dress the color of all the sea and all its fishes. When the prince heard this new request of Dionysus, he was a bit discouraged. However, he searched for the dress, and at last, after spending a great sum of money, he did procure such a gown. When Dionysus saw the dress the color of the sea and all its fishes had been found for her, she again went to seek counsel from her old playmate. Do not be afraid, the serpent said again to her. This time you must ask the prince to get you a dress the color of the sky and all its stars. You must also tell him that this is the last present you will ask him to make you. When the prince heard the demand for a dress the color of the sky and all its stars, he was completely discouraged. But when he heard that Dionysa had promised that this would be the last present she would ask for, he took heart and set out at once to procure the dress with all possible speed. At last, he found just such a dress. Oh, and when Dionysus saw the dress, the color of the sky, and all of its stars, she thought surely this time there was no escape from marrying the prince. She called the sea serpent with an anxious heart, for she was afraid that even now her great friend could do nothing to help her. The sea serpent came out of the sea in answer to her call. Go home to the palace and get your dress, the color of the field, and all its flowers, said the serpent, and your dress, the color of the sea, and all its fishes, and your dress, the color of the sky, and all its stars. Then hurry back here to the sea, for I have been preparing a surprise for you. You see, during all the time the prince had been procuring the wonderful gowns for Dionysa, the sea serpent had been working. She had been building a ship for Dionysa. When Dionysa returned from the royal palace with her lovely dresses, all carefully packed in a box, there was a queer little boat waiting her. It was not like any other boat she had ever seen, and she was almost afraid to get into it. But when her great friend asked her to try it, explaining the little ship which I have built for you will carry you far away over the sea to a kingdom of a prince who is the most charming prince in all the world. When you see him, you will want to marry him above all others. Dionysus fears immediately melted away. Oh, Labasima, how can I ever thank you for all you have done for me? cried Dionysa. Oh, you can do the greatest thing in the world for me, said the serpent. Though I have never told you, and I do not believe you ever suspected it, I am really an enchanted princess. I shall have to remain in the form of a sea serpent until the happiest maiden in all the world at the hour of her greatest happiness calls my name three times. Surely on the day of your wedding, you will be the happiest girl in all the world. If you will only remember to call my name three times, then you will break my enchantment and I shall once more be a lovely princess instead of a sea serpent. Dionysa promised her friend that she would remember to do this. The sea serpent asked her to promise three times just to make sure. When Dionysa had promised three times and again embraced her old playmate and thanked her for all she had done, she sailed away in the little ship, and the sea serpent disappeared into the sea. Dionysa sailed and sailed in that little ship until at last it bore her to a lovely island. Dionysa thought that she had reached her destination, so she stepped out of the boat, not forgetting to take her box of dresses with her. As soon as she was out of the boat, it sailed away. Now whatever shall I do, said Dionysa. The ship has gone away and left me. How shall I ever earn my living? I am a royal princess and have never done anything useful in my life. Dionysa surely had to do something to earn her living immediately, so she at once set out to see what she could find to do. She went from house to house, asking for food and work. At last she came to the royal palace. Here at the royal palace they told her that they had great need of a maid to take care of the hens. Dionysa thought that this was something that she might be able to do, and so she accepted the position at once. It was, of course, very different work from being a princess in a royal palace, but it provided her with food and shelter, and when Dionysa thought of having to marry the old prince, she was never sorry that she had left her home. 
Time passed, and at last there was a great feast day celebrated in the city. Everyone in the palace went, except for the little maid who minded the hens. After everybody had gone away, Dionysa decided that she would go to the feast too. She combed her hair and put on her gown, which was the color of the fields and all their flowers. In this wonderful gown, she was sure nobody would ever guess that she was a little maid who had been left at home to mind the hens. She did want to go to the feast, so she hurried there as fast as she could and arrived just in time for the dances. Now, naturally, everybody noticed the beautiful maiden in her gown, the color of the fields, and all their flowers. And even more naturally, the prince fell madly in love with her at first sight. Nobody had ever seen her before, and nobody could find out who the beautiful stranger was or where she came from. Before the feast was over, Dionysa slipped away, and when the rest of the royal household returned, there was the little maid minding the hens just as they had left her. And then the second day of the feast dawned bright and clear. Everybody went early except the little maid who looked after the hens. When the others had gone, she put on her dress the color of the sea and all its fishes, and she too went to the feast. She attracted even more attention than she had the day before. When the feast was over and the royal household had returned to the royal palace, the prince remarked to his mother, Don't you think that beautiful stranger at the feast looks like the little maid who minds our hens? Oh, what nonsense, replied his mother the queen. How could the little maid who minds our hens ever get such a wonderful gown to wear? The prince thought his mother must be right, but just to make sure, the prince told the royal counselor to find out if the little maid who minds the royal hens had been at the feast. All the servants told about leaving her at home with the hens and coming back and finding her just as they had left her. Hmm, whoever the beautiful stranger at the feast may be, thought the prince, she is the one above all others I want for my wife. I shall find her in some way. Now, as you might have guessed, the third day of the feast arrived, and Dionysia went, attired in her gown the color of the sky and all its stars, and the prince, he fell more madly in love with her than ever. He could not get her to tell him who she was or where she lived, but he gave her a beautiful jewel. When the prince returned home, he could not eat any food. He grew thin, and he grew pale. Everyone around the palace tried his best to invent some dish to tempt the prince's appetite. Finally, when everyone in the palace was at their wit's end, the little maid who took care of the hens, she said that she thought she could prepare a dish the prince would eat. Accordingly, she made a dish of broth for the prince, and in the bottom of the dish she dropped the jewel which the prince had given her. When that plain bowl of broth was set before the prince, he was about to send it away untouched, just as he did everything else. But then the sparkling jewel attracted his attention. Who made this dish of broth? he asked as soon as he could speak. It was made by the little maid who minds the hens, answered his mother, the queen. Send for the little maid to me at once, cried the prince. I knew the beautiful stranger at the feast looked like our little maid who minds the hens. The prince married Dionysa the next day, and Dionysa was the happiest girl in all the world. For from the first moment she had seen the prince, she had known he was the one above all others whom she wished to marry. Alas, though, in Dionysa's excitement, she had forgot all about calling the name of her old playmate at the hour of her marriage as she had promised to do. She thought of nothing but the prince. That meant there was no escape for Labus Mina. She would have to remain in the form of a sea serpent because of Dionysus' neglect. She had lost her chance to come out of the sea and become a lovely princess herself and find her own charming prince. For this reason, her sad moan is heard in the sea until this very day. Perhaps you have noticed it. You will often hear the call come from the sea as it breaks against the shore. Dionysa, Dionysa. It is enough to make even a sea serpent cry to be forgotten by the very person one has done the most to help. How the Tiger Got His Stripes You see, once upon a time, ages and ages ago, there was a tiger who had a farm. The farm was very much overgrown with underbrush, and the owner, he sought a workman to clear the ground for him to plant. The tiger called all the beasts together and said to them when they had assembled, I need a good workman at once to clear my farm of the underbrush. To the one of you who will do this, I will offer an ox in payment. Monkey was the first one to step forward and apply for the position. The tiger tried him for a little while, but he was not a good workman at all. He did not work steadily enough to accomplish anything, and so the tiger, he discharged him very soon, and he did not pay him. Next, the tiger hired the goat to do the work. The goat worked faithfully enough, but he did not have the brains to do the work well. He would clear a little of the farm in one place, and then he would go away and work in another part of it. He never finished anything neatly. The tiger discharged him very soon, and he didn't pay him either. 
Next, the tiger tried the armadillo. The armadillo was very strong, and he did the work well. The trouble with him was that he had such an appetite. There were a great many ants about the place, and the armadillo could never pass by a sweet, tender, juicy ant without stopping to take a bite to eat. It was lunchtime all day long with armadillo, and so sadly the tiger discharged him and sent him away without paying him anything. At last, Rabbit applied for the position. The tiger laughed at him and said, Why, little rabbit, you're too small to do the work. The monkey, the goat, and the armadillo have all failed to give satisfaction. Of course, a little beast like you will naturally fail, too. Unfortunately for Tiger, but fortunately for Rabbit, there were no other beast who had applied for the position. So the tiger finally sent for Rabbit and told him he would try him for a little while. Rabbit worked faithfully, and Rabbit worked well, and soon he had cleared a large portion of the ground. The next day he worked just as well. The tiger thought that he had been very lucky to hire the rabbit. He got tired staying around to watch the rabbit work, and the rabbit seemed to know just how to do the work anyway, even without someone watching, so the tiger decided to go away on a hunting trip. He left his son just to keep an eye on the rabbit. After the tiger had gone away, the rabbit said to the tiger's son, the ox which your father is going to give me is marked with a white spot on his left ear and another on his right side, isn't he? Oh, no, replied the tiger's son. He is red all over with just a tiny white spot on his ear. The rabbit worked for a little while longer, thinking, and then he said, The ox which your father is going to give me is kept by the river, isn't he? Why, yes, replied the tiger's son. The rabbit was wily. He had made a plan to go and get the ox without waiting to finish his work. But just as he started off, he saw the tiger returning. The tiger noticed that the rabbit had not worked so well when he was away. After that, he stayed and he watched the rabbit until the whole farm was cleared. Then the tiger gave the rabbit the ox as he'd promised. And as he handed the ox over, tiger had one warning for rabbit. He said, you must always keep this ox in a place where there are neither flies nor mosquitoes. Rabbit went away with the ox. After he had gone for some distance, he thought he would take a rest. But he heard a cock crowing in the distance, and he knew that there must be a farmyard near. There would be flies, of course. He went further, and again thought that he would rest. The ground looked moist and damp, and so did the leaves and the bushes. Since the rabbit thought that there would surely be mosquitoes there, he did not rest. So Rabbit trudged on, leaving the ox behind him. He came to a high place where there was a strong breeze blowing. There will surely be no mosquitoes here, he said to himself. This place is so far removed from any habitation that surely there are no flies either. He decided to rest with his ox. But just as he was laying down, along came Tiger. Oh, Rabbit, you have been such a good friend of mine, said the tiger, and now I am so very, very hungry that all my ribs show as you can see. Will you not be a good, kind rabbit and give me a piece of your lunch? So the rabbit gave the tiger a piece of his lunch. The tiger, he devoured it in a twinkling of an eye, and then he leaned back and said, Is that all you're going to give me to eat? Now the tiger looked so big and so savage that the rabbit dare not refuse to give him any more of his lunch. Now that giant tiger, he ate and ate until he had devoured the rabbit's entire lunch. Poor rabbit had not been able to get even a tiny morsel of it. He was very angry at the tiger. One day, not long after, the rabbit went to a place not far from the tiger's house and began cutting down big staves of wood. Tiger soon happened along and asked him what he was doing. I'm getting ready to build a big stockade around myself, replied the rabbit. Haven't you heard the orders? The tiger said that he hadn't heard of any such orders. Hmm, that's very strange, said the rabbit. The order has gone forth that every beast shall fortify himself by building a stockade around himself. All the beasts are doing it. Now at that, tiger became very much alarmed. Oh dear, oh dear, what shall I do, he cried. I don't know how to build a stockade. I never could do it in all the wide world. Oh, good rabbit, oh, kind rabbit, you're such a very good friend of mine. Couldn't you, as a great favor to me because of our long friendship, build a stockade about me before you build one around yourself? Now Rabbit moaned, and Rabbit complained about the danger to his own life of building the tiger's fortifications first, but finally he consented to do it. The rabbit cut down great quantities of long, sharp sticks. He set them firmly in the ground around the tiger. He fastened others securely over the top until the tiger was completely shut in by strong bars. And then he went away, and he left the tiger. And tiger, he waited, and he waited for something to happen to show him the need of the fortifications. But nothing happened at all. Nothing except for tiger getting very hungry and very thirsty. After a time, Monkey passed that way, and the tiger called out, Oh, Monkey, has the danger passed? 
The monkey, he didn't know what danger the tiger meant, but he replied, Sure, yes. Relieved, the tiger said, Oh, monkey, oh, good, kind monkey, will you not please be so kind as to help me out of my stockade? Monkey, remembering the work that he had done and not being paid, said to the tiger, Let the one who got you in there help you get out as he went on his way. Along came the goat, and the tiger called out, Oh, goat, has the danger passed? The goat, he didn't know anything about danger, so he replied, Yes, just to be amiable. Then the tiger said, Oh, goat, oh, goat, oh, good, kind goat, please be so kind as to help me out of my stockade. But goat, remembering how he had worked his hooves to the nub without being paid, said, Let the one who got you in there help you out, and he went on his way. Along came the armadillo, and the tiger called out, Oh, armadillo, has the danger passed? The armadillo had not heard of any danger, but he replied, Certainly, it has passed. Then tiger said, Oh, armadillo, oh, good, kind armadillo, you have always been such a good friend and neighbor. Please help me now to get out of my stockade. Hmm, said armadillo, thinking back to how shabbily he'd been treated doing all that work with an area payment in sight, said, Let the one who got you in there help you get out and he too went on his way. Tiger, now very, very hungry, and very, very thirsty, but also quite vexed, jumped and jumped with all of his might at the top of the stockade, but he could not break through. He jumped and jumped with all of his might at the front side of the stockade, but he could not break through. He thought that never in the world would he be able to break out. He rested for a little while, and as he rested he thought how bright the sun was shining outside. He thought what good hunting there was in the jungle. He thought how cool the water was at the spring. Once more he jumped and jumped with all of his might at the backside of the stockade. And at last the tiger he met with some small success. He did not get through, however, without getting bad cuts on both sides of his body from the sharp edges of the staves. And so from that day to this the tiger has stripes down both of his sides as a reminder that one should always give fair payment for a fair day's